back there. Welcome to Forge. I'm glad you're here. And uh, we just finished a series in 1 John. And so one of the things that we're doing uh, it, during, during July is doing some uh, independent or uh, topical uh, studies as we, uh, as we focus. And one of the things that we uh, are continuing to do as men, we talk about all things men. Forge is about discipleship, and we continue uh, talking about how we as men are developed by God's grace to be the men that we want to be and the men that we were designed to be. Uh, But it takes a man to develop a man, and Jesus Christ builds great men as God defines greatness. So that's what we're about, and we need to get together and do that. So on a weekly, we don't take a break even during the summer except 4th of July. How many of you guys blew some stuff off? Really? That's all? Come on. Nobody else blew stuff. We blew tons of stuff off, and it was a, it was a lot of fun. But um, we're not really taking any time off because discipleship never ends. And so we continue all through the summer, and uh, we only take a couple of weeks off a year. But one of the subjects that we have to talk about that pertains to men is sex. And so the topic today is sex and men. I was talking to one of our guys who uh, brought up that he said to me the other day at lunch, he said, I I wish we were talking about uh, women and sex. And I said, well, yeah, I I get your point. That's what we are. We are talking about that. Uh, But... um, But this is a gift, as as Bishop prayed when we started out our time this morning, sex is a gift of God. It's a great, wonderful gift in the context where it was designed to be. But one of the things we struggle with is, guys, and if you don't struggle with this, you know guys that do, is the issue of pornography and the issue of affairs and how all some of these are related. we got to talk about these things. And so before uh, we we start that, I want to say one thing. The gospel of Jesus Christ is about the grace of God. And there isn't a man in here who's got a perfect Christian life. There isn't a man in here who hasn't struggled with sex at some level. All of us have. And Jesus died for our sins and rose again for our sins in this area. But guys, we got to talk. And so my friend Dan Wabshaw is going to come forward. Dan's going to tell his story with pornography. Dan, come on, come on up front, and uh, and I appreciate. I'm going to put you right up here in the very center. And Dan's going to kind of unpack his story uh, of pornography, and uh, and then Dr. Tim Lloyd and I are going to come forward, and we're going to talk uh, after that. Not going to be any table talk time today. So we're just dealing with this this subject. So Dan. Thank you for your vulnerability, your willingness. I, you know, I couldn't do this, but Dan has been called to share, and uh, we appreciate you, Dan. All right, go for it. Can you hear me now? Hey, just like Verizon, here you go. (laughs) Well, good morning. Um, What a pleasure it is to be here with you. But um, I learned very quickly in my walk with Christ that before I do anything of this nature, I need to turn it over to him in prayer. So let's bow for just a moment and, and invite the Lord into this. Father, I praise you and give you thanks for this morning. I thank you for every man that is gathered in this room that is sitting here today. It takes courage to come and discuss This very difficult, it can be a difficult topic of pornography and sex. And as Pete said, you have created sex, and it is a beautiful thing when it is used in the context in which you intend. Father, I pray that every word I speak this morning will bring glory to your name, will edify your church that is gathered here. And if there's someone here today who is struggling with this issue, the words will give them hope, give them encouragement, and maybe the courage to reach out and ask for help. It is in the unmatched and mighty name, name of Jesus Christ, uh, who I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to sit still for once. I usually am all over the place, so I'm going to try and sit in a stool in in one spot today. As Pete said, my name is Dan Wabshaw. Um, I'm originally from Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes, of which we actually drive on in the winter. We actually drive on frozen lakes in the wintertime. 
I've been married to my wife, Julie, for it'll be 33 years this September. And you guys may have been praying for this, or some guys have been. My wife has been trying to get a job in Orlando for 10 months to get her off the road. She travels 100% of the time. She got word last night that a position she's applied for, the accounting manager said, the job is yours as far as I am concerned. So praise God for that answer. Uh, we have three adult daughters. Ashley, age 24, is a blonde. Jennifer, age 27, is a redhead. And Danielle, age 30, is a brunette. Yes, they're all ours. They're all mine. Um, yeah, they are a skydiver, a mechanic, and a crazy athlete in that order. So I'm a very blessed father. I grew up in a home, uh, the youngest of four siblings. I am not, there's nine years between myself and my sister. So that kind of tells you that I was not necessarily planned, but along I came anyway. Um, my mom and dad were both in the home my entire life. Uh, my dad passed away in 2010, and they were married 61 years at that time. Um, kind of unheard of today. Um, you know, my mom was the very outward, loving, nurture, hugs, I love you very much that way. Uh, my dad, not so much. He was of a generation World War II vet, pretty quiet about those kind of things. Not a lot of hugs, um, very few hugs that I can remember, and I never heard the words, I love you. I never heard him speaking to my siblings or my, mo or my mom or to me. Um, did I know that he loved me? As an adult, I can look back and say, yes, I could see that in his actions. But as a child, I don't think I really understood what love was, um, but I knew the love of my mother, and I did not get that from dad. So as a child, there wasn't that loving connection that was there. We're a church-going family. From the time I can remember, we were attending a Lutheran church. We went. My mom was really going for to, to seek the Lord and to be fed, to see friends. But for my dad, it was pretty much a social gathering for him. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of spiritual need behind it. But boy, I tell you what, I was up on Sunday morning, and I was at church whether I liked it or not. Um, they saw to that until I turned 18. You know, as a, as a child growing up, as a little bit of an oops child, there were some, some things that I noticed as a child that were different between myself and my siblings. I didn't get the same attention from dad that they got. Um, I never heard him speak to my siblings. I never heard him say things like, don't be so stupid. And those are words that I heard as a child. And those stung and those leave wounds. And even well into my adulthood, and even today, quite frankly, um, I battle with putting those statements aside. Those are wounds that we carry for a long time unless we are able to find a way to deal with them in a very healthy, Christ-like fashion. They, they make us and shape us to who we believe we are. And for me, that was an issue for a long time. At age 12, in 1973, so I kind of just dated myself, I came across a piece of pornography for the first time in our home. And my dad had lots of it. Um, I didn't understand what I was looking at, although, boy, did I feel different. There was a, a, a sense of excitement, while at the same time, a recognized sense of, I probably shouldn't be looking at this. I didn't understand why, but there was an innate sense that this is wrong to look at, but I couldn't put it down. And what had awakened in me that I didn't even understand what it was, was my sexuality. But what 12-year-old has a grasp on what human sexuality even is to understand it? All I knew is it was exciting, it was fun, and at this age, I'd already become bullied. I was picked on. Um, two of my three older siblings, I was pretty much the butt of a lot of their jokes. Um, my brother Jim was the, the second oldest up from me, not so much. He never engaged in that kind of 
joking around with me and, and picking on me. And to that, and because of that, to this day, the two of us are very, very close in comparison to the other two. Um, but what it didn't take me long to figure out is this pornography led to masturbation, and that masturbation became a great medication for the bullying, for the, the anxiety, the, the, the picking out, all of that. It became a way as a 12-year-old, 13-year-old, 14-year-old and on to medicate. I didn't understand it as self-medication, but again, hindsight get, it gives me the privilege to look back and see exactly what I was doing. Now, fast forward to a high school senior. It's now 1979. Six years later, I'm full-blown addicted to pornography and masturbation by this time. The only girlfriend I ever had in eighth grade moved away, and in my entire high school year, not one date, not one prom, nothing. Had a lot of girlfriends, but none of them were interested in dating me. I was four foot 11 when I started high school. I weighed about 90 pounds when I graduated. I was five foot 11 and a half and didn't weigh a whole lot more than I did when I was four foot 11, okay? Being pole was a common nickname for me and that was coined by my sister. But at age 18, I began to follow my brother Jim's footsteps, became an EMT. Shortly after that, I joined the police reserve and eventually applied and, and got a job as a 911 dispatcher in our community. Now it's 10,000 people. So when you're in a town that small, in that public uh, uh, occupation, people begin to know you. Um, so there wasn't too many people who didn't know at least who I was or what I did. I meet my wife um, in the years that followed. In September of 1984, we got married. Um, but when I met my wife, this always gets people's attention, she was married. And she was actually married to one of my best friends. But what I didn't understand was that she was living a, she was living a, a life that she had to hide because she was being verbally and physically abused. That came to light when I drove through the bank drive up window one morning and saw her with a black eye. She claimed it was from a volleyball injury. I'd been in emergency medicine long enough to know by now that that was not the truth. It was shortly after that it was revealed by her to a close mutual friend that her husband had punched her again, and she was done. She'd been a punching bag long enough and was leaving. They had no children, um, and who was I to stand here and tell her she should stay and keep getting hit? But she didn't have very many friends at this time, and I was one of just a very few people that helped her find a place to live, to help her get a new job, and just to walk with her because she'd been so isolated for years, she didn't hardly know anybody. But that relationship grew beyond that, obviously, because for me anyway, the very first time I saw her, this goes back to my life in the flesh, um, where I went, wow, what a beautiful woman she is. And that didn't change just because she went through all that. Um, so we began to date. And then it was February 14th, Valentine's Day, 1984, I propose. And she said, I need to think about it. <laughs> yep, here we go again. Heart's falling on the floor. She's going to say no, and I'm going to go deeper into this pornography that I am deeply entrenched in by this at this point. She had no idea that was part of who I was. I was already living a dual lifestyle by then, but nobody knew it, except for me and the Lord. But she said yes the next morning. Um, marriage went on pretty well for a while. I actually gave up pornography for a while. It is a guarantee to get married that your pornography problem will stop for about five weeks. It'll cure it for five weeks, and it'll come screaming back. And it did. I brought pornography into our marriage, into the bedroom, introduced it to her. She went along with that for a while until the deviancy that I was beginning to go to with now the invent of the Internet and things I was able to watch online for free, even at dial-up speeds. 
became so deviant, she said, uh, no, I will not watch that and I will not do that. It was shortly after that that um, she discovered that I was having, has having what was then an almost two year long online relationship with a woman from Gainesville, Florida. And look where I live today. That was the day that she drew the line on everything. She discovered all my history of chat rooms, images, conversations that had taken place over two years that um, I thought I was bright enough to hide, but was not, and she found it all. And that was the beginning of a very, very difficult stretch of years. We'd been married 19 years at this point, uh, and the very thing I promised her that I would never do to her that had been done, I did. I promised her I would never hurt her the way she was hurt in her first marriage. And this very tender, trusting heart is now crushed by the weight of my selfishness. Tore that heart wide open all over again. And it wasn't just her and I, because now we have our kids. There's kids involved. So now I've not only wounded a wife and a, and a woman, but a mother. So we sought pastoral counseling. And to be very honest with you, it didn't really help a whole lot. Uh, because at this point, uh, in 19, in, in um, wow, in, in 2003, at least in a small town, pastors didn't understand what this whole pornography thing is, how it's addictive behavior, its tendencies, its power, its hold, that it gets a hold of a man and more and more increasing women these days. They didn't even know what, the, what animal they're fighting. So in his defense, he just didn't understand what was going on. Went, saw him four weeks and said, just spend more time reading the Bible and you'll be fine. Well, that didn't work. <laughs> but we did commit to making it work. Now understand, I knew God at this point in my life, but I didn't know his son. I'd heard the name Jesus, and I knew of him. I knew that he went to a cross, but it was nothing personal about the relationship. So in this journey of beginning to heal, I was failing often, blowing it often, but I had men who had begun to step into my life who were beginning to hold me accountable. In the midst of all this came a job change, a temporary job change, and in the midst of that, God introduced me to some people who knew him as their Lord and Savior, and they began to introduce me to this very same Savior. And what was really cool, I've always been a music guy, loved music all my life, taught myself how to play the drums listening to Boston, Creedence, Clearwater, the Beach Boys, okay, it was, that's what I grew up with. Um, it's a lot of fun. So this, one of these, one of these guys who had three other brothers who sang an a cappella Christian group, but they needed a sound and light crew for their release concert, for their CD, and then for the summer traveling. I was like, dude, I'm all over that. Sound and light, sign me up, right? So the night of that release concert, for the first time in my entire life, standing in a, in a room of about 30 people, we prayed, and I prayed for everybody but myself for the first time in my life at age 42. I'd never prayed for anybody else but me my entire life. The concert went off without a hitch. It was a wonderful time. And I went home that night, and the only thing I can tell you is I felt different, but I felt lighter. That's the only word I can use to describe how I felt when I left. The next morning was a day that... Um, even all these years later, we'll see if it does this morning. It usually brings tears to my eyes. It usually causes me to cry like a 12-year-old. We'll see what happens today. There were two songs, old hymns, that these guys sang. Shine on me and holy, holy, holy. See? Already happening. 
as I sat and listened to those songs repeatedly, I heard God call. He said, come to me. And in that, that Monday morning, March 29th, I didn't invite, accept Jesus. I begged him into my life. I asked him to take all the pain, all the shame, all the hurt that I had given and had received and take it. And I literally felt decades of pain and weight lift from my shoulders that morning. I can't describe to you the feeling that took place that day. I met Jesus. The real Jesus. The one I'd never known. And over the course of the next seven years, he not only restored me, but he introduced me to men who would disciple me, who would walk with me, continue to hold me accountable, to love me with the love of Christ, to restore a marriage that was deeply broken, to take three kids who were in their own running from God and from me as a dad. And as I came to Christ and life, life began to change, Christ began to change me, they followed me to Christ. All three professed Jesus as Lord and Savior. And the oldest and youngest right now are on fire for Christ. Get out of their way. They'll run you over with a cross. Both of them have the cross tattooed right here. One says, paid in full. I'm wandering from my notes. God's word was huge because I didn't understand I needed to see counselors and therapists and all this sort of thing. So God's word, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is what set me free. Spending time in his word, time with brothers who walked with me, they set me free. When Christ said the truth will set you free, I get that because I picked up that truth and I read it and it equipped me and it transformed my mind. It renewed my mind by being transformed by the renewing of my mind. Romans 12, 2 is a verse I will forever be grateful that is in the passages of the Bible. And know this, no matter where you are in your journey, that he who began a good work in you will carry that on until the day of completion when Christ shows up to take us home. I'm on a journey until then. I'm a broken mess until then. I'm just a mess that's in the hands of a loving Savior who's taking my mess and neatening it back up day by day. In 2004 to 2011, as I said before, you had a, a very broken man, a very broken marriage, and a, and, a, and a damaged family that God restored. Brought me to a place where I loved my wife in a way that I didn't know was humanly possible. I understand as best I can in a human mind when two become one. I get that as much as is possible. There is something very unique about the relationship between Christ and his church and what marriage is to look like in the mirror image of that. I think as a church, as a whole, we grossly underestimate why God created that mirror image. The only one in the marriage between the Christ and the church that sacrificed it all was Jesus. And he gave it up for the undeserving. Men, we represent Christ in the church as Savior in, in marriage. We are the only ones. I am the only one that is called to sacrifice and to die for someone who may not deserve it. That's my responsibility as a man and as a husband. And that's not my creation. That's what Christ says in his word. 2011 was a busy time, and I'm going to go through this fast, but a lot happened. March 2nd, I had near heart attack at work. I had collapsed 
as an EMT getting ready to go home on my shift. My partners threw me in the ambulance, drove me 25 miles to a hospital. The next day I had two stents for two plugged arteries in the front of my heart. I was no heavier than I am today. I was not a drinker, I was not a smoker, and there was no history in my family that I knew of. And I was an active guy. God spared me there. I heard God calling me in 2011. He said, just go tell your story, Dan. Because I could feel a call. What do you want me to do? And I'm marching around the church, <laughs> quite literally walking around our church building. He said, just go tell your story. I said, okay, how do I do that? And he has opened so many doors. September 6th, 2011, a Tuesday morning, 10 o'clock, our pager goes off for a call for a three-month-old child that is not breathing. The house for this call is right around the corner from our quarters. It took us 20 seconds to drive there. Over the next hour, I did CPR on three-month-old Odie and prayed for God to spare this child, and he did not survive. I was done. In November 7th, on November 7th, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. The, the Christian psychologist said, your days as an EMT, 32 years of her career are over. You're done. So we went through all kinds of paperwork with my employer. They, I got the, the word that um, January 31st will be my last official day as an employee of North Memorial Ambulance which is based in Robbinsdale, Minnesota. And what is incredible is that my wife and I had been discussing that as a retirement date for me from EMS. Nobody else knew that but Julie and I and God. But that was the day the hospital gave me this, says, you're done. That was 2011. Pretty uh, interesting year. In 2012, I met the guys from Be Broken Ministries for the first time at a men's conference. We visited, we shared stories a little bit. Two conferences later, I met him again, and one of the, their training managers said, have you ever thought about coming on board with another ministry as being a, a staff member? And I said, well, no, I'm kind of doing this whole ministry thing on my own, speaking to guys and mentoring men one-on-one -on -one who are struggling with pornography at this point. Um, but I said, I'll think about that. I visit with Jonathan, the founder of the ministry, a few days later at the end of the conference, and he said, give it some thought. Went home, talked to my wife. We set up a conference call with Jonathan, uh, visited with him, and in the, in, the, in the context of that conversation, we told him that we wanted to move to Florida. We're ready to be done with Minnesota winters. I was sick of shoveling scraping windows, and our oldest daughter had been living here for four years and wanted mom and dad to be closer. So I told him that, and uh, he said, well, that confirms something we've been thinking since we met you. We've been praying that God would send a man along who would be willing to be the Southeast Regional Manager for Be Broken Ministries in the United States. Are you willing? I looked at my wife, and I said, what do you think? And she looked at me and said, what are you asking me for? The answer was yes. That was November 2015, September 20th of last year. We drove the U-Haul in here, moved into our apartment building. Um, and then 10 months later, here I stand before you to share my story. And it's a story not about me. It's a story about the redeeming power of Jesus Christ. It's, it's a story of hope. There's no, none of us are too broken for an almighty sovereign God to reach. There's no story too hopeless. There was a point in, in all of this journey before I knew Christ where our oldest daughter, in the midst of our recovery, was diagnosed with anorexia. She was fighting for her life. Danielle was nearly dead. She was in intensive care for three days, received eight liters of IV fluid just to get her blood pressure back to normal. And not one time in those three days with all that fluid did she need to go to the bathroom. That was all happening at the same time I found myself in a pit of depression, 
suicide was a daily thought for about two months. I know what it's like to be at the bottom of yourself, but that's where I met Jesus. And he said, I'm enough, and I will redeem you. So that brings me here today. I know my time is up. Um, I would like to just share with you what we do. Part of what we do at Be Broken is we have a, it's called Gateway to Freedom. That I'm part of what I do here. It's a three-day men's intensive for guys who are struggling with a, a sexual brokenness issue, or maybe they're just getting ready to be married, and they want to make sure their purity walk is right. Um, so they will come through that three-day. I have the privilege of of teaching the sessions in that, and we have trained counselors that are present. We're holding them here in Orlando for the first time, August 18th, 19th, and 20th, right here at Canterbury. And we are excited to be able to reach the Southeast U.S. We have men who have already signed up. It's limited to 16 guys. Um, and it's a very intense, but powerful three days. Every man from every walk of life has walked through the doors. And we've seen him come in with no hope and walk out filled with at least hope for restoration, healing, uh, and restored lives and marriages. And uh, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you for, for listening this morning. You know, you could hear it. You could hear a nasal drip in here when he was talking. A pin yeah. drop. My own. Uh, Dr. Tim Lloyd, come on up here. And uh, Dr. Tim Lloyd is a marriage family counselor, uh, uh, also with expertise in autism, and uh, has a unique uh, ministry. Former pastor as well. Tim, I'm going to put you there, uh, and just ask you to, um, in, in your experience with men <clears throat> and families, kind of kind of follow up with a couple of uh, points. First of all, Dan, God bless you. You um, are such an example of courage and honesty and vulnerability to us all. Uh, what you did today, exposing your weakness, is what true manhood, it's the place where it begins. And, you know... As a marriage family therapist, um, I can tell you from my vantage point that, that there is hope, that there is healing, there is restoration, that, that God can restore people. Um, you know, sometimes people say, you know, people don't change, but people do change. In the power of Christ, they change. And perhaps you're here today and you're, you're thinking, you know, I, I, I'd love to serve God. I'd love to be more. I'd love to do more. But, but my life's just not ready right now. I, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough. And what Dan shows us today is God can use us all. But it's a process. Mm -hmm. And so, Dan, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, that was raw. And look what God is doing with your life right now, helping others. Um, when I was a young man in my 20s, I, I started pastoring. And I realized that I was way over my head. And I got so many families dealing with so many issues, pornography, incest, multiple affairs within the church, outside of the church, all kinds of craziness. And my heart as a pastor was to help people and to, to, to change lives, right? And all I, all I knew from seminary was the Word of God, and the Word of God is wonderful, and it has the answer for everything. But I knew for me I needed additional skills. And so in my early 30s, I went into graduate school and, and, and pursued a doctorate and so forth like that. And... For now, about 17 years, I've been a professional uh, marriage and family therapist. And, um, and the path of restoration is beautiful. The guys that I can help are guys like Dan, who come with a brokenness. Generally, what happens is very identical to what happened in Dan's story. They're caught. And what I have is, is, is a wife that makes the phone call or she makes the husband make the phone call and here they come in and you've got, 
You've got a wife who is crushed, broken, devastated. She feels replaced, uh, diminished. Her esteem is absolutely demolished. And if the man's broken and wants to save his family, I can help that guy. But if he's still minimizing and kind of putting it down and blowing it off and just wanting to get out of the jam, I can't, I can't help that guy. But I can say after many years that, that there are many, many, many Dan's who get the victory and get the help. But when I listen to Dan's story, I listen to the beginning. And no matter who we are, it tends to go back to dad and home and how we grew up. Dan, when you told your story, you didn't get hugs from your dad. You didn't no. get intimate. He never modeled for you intimacy. Mm-hmm. And you didn't get affirmation from him. You got put downs. Mm-hmm. And would I, would I be right in, in suggesting that probably your, your drift into pornography and online relationships was in many ways to get validation as a man? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and it was, I could engage in those relationships, and I'll even call it a relationship with pornography. Now, that sounds odd, but it was, and it is for men, because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pseudo-intimacy and love. That's right. It, it, but it's one way. You really get nothing in return, but what you also don't get is the fear of being rejected, because you can just shut it off and everything's fine. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, Yeah. So let, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that for a minute. I'm going to steal the mic. Uh, you know, the, the idea of a false intimacy here. You know, you, you didn't have a relationship with your dad that was deep. And, and how do we learn how to have a relationship as men? We ought to learn how men have relationships from our dad, you know. But a lot of times our dads don't teach us. So if we don't do that, we try to figure it out, right? Yeah. So that led to uh, a relationship with pornography to medicate the pain. And then on top of that, a false relationship. Talk about that briefly, both of you, real quickly, about how, how, um, how pornography is really a false relationship that hinders the real relationship that we should have in marriage. Yeah, for me, it became a safe place to go. Um, and this is something I, I realized later. But the work I did... In public safety, you know, you go on ambulance calls, you take 911 calls, all that kind of stuff. I couldn't talk about work at home because of confidentiality. And therefore, the communication broke down at home. So to find a place where I felt I could just be myself, to be, to be loved, uh, and, and to truly seek to validate myself as a, as a man, um, that's where I went. I went to these online relationships and didn't have to fear of being told no. Back in the day, there was a lot of movement with counselors to actually encourage the use of pornography to mm-hmm. stimulate relationships within the, within the marriage confines and things like that. The research today is completely the opposite. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you look at the, the Gottman Foundation and even, even Time Magazine uh, last year in 2016 did a whole issue in a, a detailed article about pornography and the, the threat of virility. Um, and, and what happens, and what I've seen time and uh, again and again in relationships, when pornography is introduced, it drives husbands and wives further apart, and the man drifts to pornography, there's no need for real intimacy, it, it is that false intimacy, it, it does not bring couples together, it, it actually lessens the desire in a man for his natural wife. Um, there is, and I'll just give you a little bit of the research behind it, there was a, a research study on the, the stickleback fish. Uh, you're probably, maybe some of you are familiar with the idea of the psychological, con- psychological concept of conditioning. Well, what happens with the stickleback fish is they, they, they applied the, the principle of a super stimulus. And so the stickleback fish is a male, and during mating season, he will naturally attack 
um, other males that come into his territory. So even with fish, there's a man code. And so, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, good to know. Um, so what they did was they dropped a, um, a, a false, a fake, a mock steckleback fish. And the false fish had larger fins. And the false fish had a bright red belly as opposed to a dull red belly. And you know what happens? That, that fish goes after the mock. And after a time of pairing, the mock fish became more stimulating. And the, the, the real fish is left alone. And what happens in, in the, the overage use of pornography is a wife will be left alone. I would have husbands and wives in counseling sessions where the wife is begging for intimacy. She's begging for physical relationship with her husband, but the husband spends more time in front of his computer screen <coughs> or in a private room or wherever. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so pornography, it does not promote intimacy in no shape or form. And it oftentimes is a gateway toward other stuff, a gateway toward online relationships and extramarital affairs. Let, let me ask you this, <clears throat> because as you say, pornography is like another addiction, right? Oh, I mean, right. pornography is an addiction, right? And mm -hmm. if those of you guys that have struggled with substance abuse know that addictions, uh, as one counselor said, I don't know if this is true, but a counselor told me this, so you can clear it up if it's not true. But addictions come in pairs with spares. In other words, if you have one, you're likely to have another. And addictions also are progressive. Mm -hmm. and, and they take more and more of your time, more and more of your energy, and demand more of you until you have nothing less left, until they kill you. I have had staff members who have struggled with uh, pornography addiction and found them less and less available for our people to minister to them and more and more time alone in their offices. Uh, address address addic the addictive aspect of that, and then I'm going to pull it together and wrap it up uh, here for us, okay? Um, one thing I will say quickly is in the line of, of the addictive behavior, there is one thing lust will never say, I've had enough. It will, I know that I started looking at your average pornography at age 12. By the time I was 42 years old, the, the depth of depravity that had grown would probably make you sick to your stomach if I told you what I was looking at. Because you will, I was taken to places by lust and in in that addiction that I told myself I would never go. No way will I ever look at this, go there, and do that. But after that many years, I had gone there, thought about it, and I was looking at it, and I was getting into strip clubs all over the place with my law enforcement ID for free. And the stress of that was in the double life. Oh, absolutely. That duplicitous life. Just... A, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways, James mm -hmm. says. Um, with regard to duplicity and living that double life, that secret life. They, the research says that for every year that a man lives a double life, five years are taken off of his life. And it's, 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 it's discovered in the secrecy of pornography or having an affair for years that go on and on and on. Um, and, and it causes such stress. Now, in the, in the Christian world, we, we think of things like conviction and, and, and it happens but what happens we dismiss it and we rationalize it and we make all kinds of intellectual arguments and, and, and we live with it and it's it's a horrible horrible way to live there's a, there's a theory in, in counseling and psychology of cognitive dissonance and it's the idea that that if my beliefs are one way, my behavior is another way. The further my beliefs are from my behavior, the more stress. It causes a structural tension. But the closer my beliefs and my behaviors are in line, it, it brings peace. It, being, it brings calmness and the lack of anxiety. And, and so we, we, in the Christian world, know that just as godly living. But, but so, so many people that are in this addictive spiral 
and this addictive cycle are stressed out. Um, and I know we're running out of time, so. Wow, that's powerful. Well, we weren't going to, we were, our intention was not to cover everything here today about this subject. But, it, but it's to raise these issues. And I want to just summarize uh, a couple of things and get you out of here uh, on time today um, <clears throat> by saying a, a couple of things you've already, already said. Um, you told your story, uh, and you were straightforward. You've seen a lot of stories. I've seen a lot. You know, as a pastor, and we have pastors in here, and people come into our office, and they say, Pastor, i got to tell you something. This is going to shock you. And after you've been a pastor for a certain period of time, yeah, Dan's shaking his head over there. there I don't get shocked anymore. I just get more stories to tell other people. <laughs> but the bottom line, and I don't, I, don't, I don't pass on the names, but the bottom line. Oh, my. Guys, I want you to know, when you've been a pastor for a while, right, Jay? You're unshockable. People come in and they tell you this stuff. No, because we, we've got an, we've got, we understand this, that sin can lead us down paths we don't want to go. And Jesus has redeemed us from that. And I want, I want you guys to understand a couple of things about this, that the depths that you've gone, we've probably all gone in different ways. And if we knew what was going on, and if you knew some of the thoughts I had sometimes while I'm driving or I'm thinking I'm alone, man, it's intense. You'd say, you're not a Christian. Sometimes I say, I'm not a Christian. And so, and so we men can harbor a lot of things in our hearts and minds that Jesus died for, that he wants to redeem. And so in a very personal way, I, I, love, I love what you guys have said, that the gospel and the gospel of grace can cause us to be redeemed and can grow in ways that we never imagined. If we would allow and understand that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, he died for these kinds of things, our sins, these sins, and other sins that we haven't talked about. And so there's hope for redemption and clarity and growth and renewal. Uh, there is hope for all of us. But secondly, I want us to know that there's hope for guys that we interface with all the time. And that the guys in our church that come on Sunday morning are dealing with all of this stuff. And, 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 and we're, if we're dealing with it, there's hope for us. But there's other men. And who's going to reach out to another man? You know, it, it, it takes another guy to do that. And there's some guys that we got to kick each other's butt in Jesus' name. And say, man, you're going where you need not go. And I love you, and I want to be your friend in this. And so, and so part of this is to, to, to let Dan's story out there, let grace help us tell our own stories mm -hmm. to other guys of how guys, God has brought grace and freedom to us, but also to energize us to get involved in other guys' lives. We, we tend as a church to think that evangelism is the most effective on a mass basis. Let's get some great evangelists in, bring them to this thing, and guys will get saved. But a lot of times evangelism is one-on-one, -on -one and the guys that, that, um, that God brings into our lives. That's probably you. It's me interfacing with the men around us. And will we have the courage to move into another guy's life and say, I want to be your friend in this? As, they, uh, as we see sin and brokenness in their own life. Even unbelievers need friends uh, that have been there, done that, and have gotten the freedom in Christ. Um, if you are struggling with this and have never talked about it with anybody, then I want you to know that uh, uh, you, could, you can email me, text me, and we can put you, you can talk to Tim, you can talk to Dan, you can talk to me. You can get uh, our contact. We'll get our contact. You know, my contact information is on the bottom of this. We'll get you in contact with somebody. Mm -hmm. If you've never talked about it, let's do it. Talk to your table leader. Grace gives us the ability to talk about everything, right? That's right. Because we are sons of the... How many times have I said this here? You don't believe me. In Christ, we are God's deeply beloved sons. And that will never change in all time and eternity. You're his son. That's your core identity. Leadership, work, being a warrior out there, those are, those are our core roles. But our core, core identity is his sons. It's never going to change. And so uh, when, we, when we learn our core identity and live out of that, we can face all of the junk that we got to face and get free and continue to grow. But there is another side to this, and that is we need brothers.
So our tables are not just for discussion. Our tables are a means for us to develop brothers who we can, yeah, spill our guts with. And, 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 and we'll never move ahead if we're stuck in these kinds of things. So forge is not just, hey, let's talk, let's talk about stuff. It's let's grow. Let's let the gospel make us disciples and set us free day in and day out. And I encourage you to get in touch with one of us. If, uh, don't let this go. Deal with it, all right? And, uh, and begin to get the freedom that you really want uh, and that you really can have in Christ. There is so much that can be said, but we're gonna get, we're gonna, I'm going to give you the grace of letting you out of here five minutes early. <laughs> that has never happened in the history of Forge. But that's so that if you want to talk, what? Three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. <laughs> I'm going by my clock, not yours, Rick. <laughs> Guys, let's stand up together. Stand up. I want, I want you to give Dan and Tim a round of applause. Thank you, brothers. And I, and I want to say this, that we talked yesterday, emailed yesterday, and, 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 and this got hard. You got some pressure spiritually. I did. And you've talked about this before, but there was some real spiritual pressure that was put on him uh, by the evil one. He puts it on all of us. Uh, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. free. Let's pray. Father, thank you that even in these difficult situations, we as men following Jesus can get free. It was for freedom, Jesus, that you came to set us free. You came to set us free from the curse of sin and death and hell and a life that goes back to bondage. Mm -hmm. So, Lord, we ask you to work in all of our lives, whatever the issue is. May the gospel continue to set us free. May we have brothers that help us. And, Lord, would you be with each one of us now. Uh, as we go into, into this world that doesn't love us, that is painful, that we want to medicate ourselves in many different ways. Lord, we turn to you. We run to you. We thank you for your grace. And we will continue to turn to you, our Lord Jesus. Be with my brothers, my friends. Be with our pastors. <clears throat> Be with all of us now as we head out into the world. For we pray these things in Jesus' strong and holy name. And God's men said, amen. amen. Guys, thank you. <laughs>